Hi there, uh, my name is Ken Weston. Um, I, uh, I'm going to be talking today about uh, cyber stalking. Um, I actually was able to do this uh, legally, so if you came to see a, a talk about um, how to stalk your ex-girlfriend, things like that, this probably isn't the best talk for you. Um, so um, currently, um, yeah, my name is Ken Weston. Um, I founded a company called uh, Gadget Track a, a while back. Uh, it was a startup, um, and uh, it was just sort of through some research that I was interested in um, that I sort of stumbled into this uh, industry. Um, and I'll kind of talk about so, how that evolved and how it ended up creating um, multiple products and um, how I then also started working with law enforcement to uncover um, a, a wide range of different crimes. Um, we would find that stolen devices would sort of uh, function basically as a Trojan um, into some of these um, criminal networks. So we'd be able to identify a lot of fencing operations. Uh, we would find um, drugs. We would find all sorts of other crimes that were uh, committed. Uh, even helped uh, recover a stolen vehicle at one point. Um, and I'll kind of talk through some of that um, and actually walk you through some actual cases as well. Um, so I, I developed theft recovery tools for a number of devices. I started with USB, uh, moved into laptop, mobile. Um, and through that, I found that there was also ways of um, harvesting information through social media um, by extracting um, EXIF data from images, for example. Um, and I'm going to walk through some of that as well um, and, and show you some of those tools. Um, I worked very closely with law enforcement on a number of investigations. Um, it was actually kind of the highlight of the, of the gig. Um, I actually, uh, whenever we had a customer that had a laptop stolen, I would work on that case. Um, and I worked directly with law enforcement. Um, and through that, I was actually able to learn a lot about, um, you know, how uh, law enforcement functions, um, what they're able to do, and some of the challenges with, you know, recovering a stolen device. Um, sometimes people have their phone or laptop stolen, they contact law enforcement, it doesn't seem like they're doing anything. Um, and, uh, it's, it's kind of difficult for them to do when they have thousands of devices. Um, but I found ways of sort of uh, social engineering the police into uh, paying attention to some of our cases, and I'll walk through that as well. Uh, so I put a lot of uh, bad people in jail, probably roughly um, several, uh, several dozen. Um, in a lot of these cases, it was crazy. We, you think you'd only get one person, we would end up um, arresting six to seven people in each case. Um, and a lot of these guys were pretty bad dudes. Uh, a lot of them had records already. They had warrants out for their arrest. Um, so police like to work with me. Whenever uh, we had a recovery, um, they actually started to pay attention because they knew that they were going to get some other bad guys. Um, I'm currently a senior security analyst at Tripwire, so I'm actually uh, now working on um, you know, finding uh, different types of criminals and um, helping enterprises secure their infrastructure. Um, I have a real passion for, um, for um, enabling uh, security. Uh, I love um, just uh, working with customers as well. Um, and identi identifying patterns, especially when it comes to attacks and how you can actually correlate uh, an intelligence within an environment um, to, uh, to help protect it. So this is what I like to call my wall of shame. Um, these are some photos of actual cases. So you'll see that uh, some of the faces are blur blurred out. Uh, that is to protect the guilty. Um, those are photos that were actually captured by stolen laptops. Um, the software would actually gather location from Wi-Fi networks. It would then use the web camera that's built into the devices um, to capture a photo. Um, at the time, it was, I was one of the first people actually to tie those two together to actually integrate both the web camera as well as getting location from Wi-Fi networks. Um, so that's the... That's it for this slide. So, um, and as you can imagine, um, you know, uh, not everyone was a fan of some of the stuff I'm doing. A lot of this because they didn't quite understand the intentions. Um, when you're dealing with this type of technology, you know, privacy is a big concern. Um, and that's one thing I really tried to bake into the products was um, gather just enough information for theft recovery purposes, but not enough that it would become a, a liability for me to secure if someone were to hack into our servers, for example, um, would they be able to access everyone's web camera, things like that. Um, we also moved into actually backing up contact data and photos, um, and I was very, very paranoid about that. Um, I always assume it's not a matter of if, but when. Um, so if someone did compromise a server, for example, I didn't want them to compromise the data. Um, so we actually built in mechanisms in there where you can actually have a uh, privacy key that you enter on the device. It'll actually encrypt the information before it even hits the cloud. Um, so the nice thing there is if uh, we do get hacked or if law enforcement actually requested photos uh, from a customer, uh, we could then, sure, here you go, uh, Mr. Police Officer, here's a big encrypted blob. Um, you're going to have to go to the customer to get the privacy key because it's encrypted. Um, so there was a lot of things around that. Um, I was just very paranoid dealing with the technology to, to ensure that we actually did protect people's privacy. 
So uh, how this got started was um, I was actually working for a uh, security company. Um, at that point, most of my security was mostly focused on um, web servers. I was basically a system administrator, um, so I managed um, you know, Linux servers. Um, but we actually uh, had a product that was focused on um, uh, um, endpoints. So if uh, someone plugged in a flash drive, it would actually block them from um, installing a Trojan or stealing data off the network. Um, so I became very, very interested in uh, these sort of USB-based Trojans because I'm kind of a lazy hacker, and it's like it's just so much easier if you're actually able to infiltrate an organization and steal or compromise a network from the inside. Um, we've seen that too, even with uh, industrial control systems like Stuxnet uh, and things like that, where that was actually the, the point of, um, of attack was actually from a flash drive. Um, so I built a website called uh, usbhacks.com, um, and I actually started putting some of these exploit tools out there that I was finding. Um, also helped build some of them. Um, and as you can imagine, that was probably the first time I got contacted by the FBI. Um, <laughs> what the hell are you doing? Um, but uh, the idea there was that you know, I was able to say, you know, this is more about raising awareness. It's not uh, providing these tools for criminals. Um, and actually, when we put these tools up, it also helped antivirus vendors get signatures for them as well. Um, and we did talk about tools and techniques. And so um, you know, I actually developed a pretty, pretty big community from this. Um, but then uh, just because of some of the interest I had from both sides of law enforcement, I did decide to shut it down at one point. Um, but I was working on my, uh, my master's degree at the time, and I was like, you know, what if there's a way to take this technology and actually do some good with it? Um, you know, what if I was able to sort of take this Trojan virus and we turned it into a happy virus? Thanks, Bob. So, um, you know, the idea here is that if a, a USB flash drive uh, is stolen um, and connects to a computer, you're able to hijack that um, and send information out. And this is actually the first email that I actually got sent. So it's actually fairly simple. It grabs my um, IP address. It also grabs internal network address. Um, but more importantly, it gets the computer name and the name of the user that's logged in. Um, it's just simple, right? And again, we don't have to gather any more information than that. We don't have to open up a back door into the system. Um, this is enough information for law enforcement to follow up on that case, uh, work with the carriers to, to um, identify the subscriber if they need to. Um, and what's interesting is that you know, when I did this and I launched it, I just offered it for free. I put it out there. Um, the uh, website got, oh, you guys still hear me? The, uh, the website ended up getting uh, dug to death. We had about uh, 20,000 people register. Um, the server crashed horribly. Um, I was not prepared for it. Um, we got that ramped up, and then um, I actually offered a, a pro version. What's interesting, though, is that I found a lot of other devices that this would work with. Basically, it was uh, crowdsourced testing. Um, so it worked with not just flash drives, but also um, external hard drives. It worked with digital cameras. Um, I was even approached by um, a company that makes very high-end thermal imaging cameras, um, and I, I work with them um, to actually develop a customized agent because they found that it worked with those devices as well. Um, and even the, uh, the first iPods as well, it was, fun it was working with, so um, that was really interesting. And the code is it's fairly simple. Um, I've actually put it up on a, a website here. If you want to download that and, and, and play with it, um, go ahead. Um, I highly recommend, though, that you review the code and look at the server that it's talking to. I've said this before, but people are running the code, and I'm, I'm getting pings on one of my servers, and I'm um, getting information about your system. So um, just be very cautious when you're uh, utilizing the code. Um, and a lot of this uh, just took advantage, basically, of, of vulnerabilities within Windows XP with the auto run capability. Um, and um, even in Windows 2000, there was some, some similar functionality. Um, so it wasn't a particularly you know, complex or you know, sophisticated uh, piece of uh, code, but it, was, it worked. Um, and not only would I utilize um, the um, sort of the auto run capability to auto execute the, the binary, I would also rely on social engineering as well. I would make the file look like a password file uh, for, for the case of the thermal imaging camera. I would actually make it look like a thermal image of a cat, which I'll show you in a bit. Um, but uh, yeah, it was really interesting. So there was some, some issues here when I started actually deploying this tool is that you know, a lot of this relies on IP address, and there's a lot of problems with that, actually increasingly so for forensics. Um, it requires a lot of work by uh, law enforcement, um, and uh, any law enforcement in the room? I'm not going to offend you, but sometimes law enforcement don't like to do a lot of paperwork. <laughs> um, and sometimes that will actually have an impact on the recovery of your device. Um, it's also not identity. So it actually doesn't put the person in, in directly in front of the computer. Um, you can always say, it wasn't me. Someone else was using my computer. Um, you know, they're at a Starbucks or something like that. 
Um, and so probable cause was really, it's, an, it's a challenge when you're dealing with IP address for any sort of crime, not just recovering stolen devices. Um, it's also not always accurate. So if someone's using a proxy, again, they're at a Starbucks, um, something like that. Um, it doesn't necessarily, um, you know, it's not the smoking gun that we want. Um, and also, in general, it just takes a really long time. Um, some of these cases, when you're dealing with, like, recovering a stolen laptop, you know, time is of the essence. And some of these cases would actually take, like, two weeks to several months to actually recover just off IP address alone. So it's not particularly um, a, a useful um, piece of evidence. I actually had um, the first iPad recovery. As far as I know, it's the first iPod recovery ever uh, using tracking technology. So um, I'm still waiting for my check from Apple. Um, but, uh, you know, th this was actually uh, June 15, 2007. Uh, we were able to get this uh, connection through. Most of these cases, it was kids stealing iPods out of each other's lockers. Um, you know, so we're not actually, you know, catching the, ba the real bad guys yet. Um, but what was interesting is that um, the username was one of the most useful pieces of information. Um, this was the Kalapakis family. That ha just happened to be the, name, the username on the computer. Um, it's a very unique name. and There was only one kid in the school that um, had that, that name. So, um, so you can imagine who had the iPod. Um, but it was interesting is that, you know, it's the first sort of recovery like this using this sort of technology and this piece of evidence. Um, and then I was approached by a, a company to make a, a, a sort of a, a customized agent um, that would actually be installed on these very high-end thermal imaging cameras. These devices cost anywhere from $3,000 to $300,000. Um, so they wanted it for theft recovery purposes. But also, some of these devices are actually controlled, um, export controlled. Um, they, did, they were having some of these devices end up in facilities that they shouldn't have. Um, and so that's one of the other sort of uh, side effects of, of what they wanted to be able to track. Um, so, for example, if uh, one of these devices ends up in Iran, for example, um, then uh, you would be able to trace that back to the reseller um, and then, you know, cancel their license, of course, because they basically committed a crime. And so I, I built this customized agent, and um, it, it was really interesting is that um, they used a, 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 a little bit of flash memory, a flash card. Um, and so, you know, if a thief steals it, he could just put a new one in, right? Just get rid of the old one and the agent's gone. So we made it very persistent. We actually wrote it into the firmware where it would actually write, uh, rewrite the agent onto the, the, um, the file, on, onto the uh, memory card. So even if uh, someone put a new one in, you're still going to have some persistence there. Um, and then I uh, disguised it as uh, this cat photo. <laughs> so. Um, and actually, when I was working on my presentation, I actually found um, some old code that I uh, kind of rehashed. Um, you know, we focus mostly on Windows, uh, but people always say that, you know, Macs, you know, they're not vulnerable to this type of thing. Um, and actually, I was working on a, uh, a USB um, uh, Trojan for Macs. Um, and what I found was it was really good to use AppleScript. And the reason for that is because it's, it's trusted um, by the operating system. Um, what's really nice about Macs, too, is that there are certain applications that you know are going to be on that system, like iTunes, for example. Um, and there's also a number of other apps that also have interfaces directly with AppleScript. So um, it's a really good language if you're writing a, any sort of malware for Mac that you may want to look at that. Um, so um, there was one trick that I did with um, OS X with a homoglyph. So basically, it's just a character that looks like another character. Sorry, that's really small. but. Um, Basically, there's a protection in, in OS X where if you try to um, disguise a file um, as something other than a, a .app, like if I try to put a .mp3, um, that will automatically throw a .app at the end of it. Um, so that will then you know, give away my, uh, my Trojan because I want to disguise this as an mp3 file. Um, however, if I put what's called an Oganet character in there, that's a little Turkish character. It's a Unicode character that looks very similar to a pyramid, uh, sorry, a period. Um, then um, it actually tricks it. Apple doesn't throw the .app on the end of it, so you can disguise the file as you know, uh, justinbieber.mp3. Uh, um, and then I go into, and then you can also modify the, um, the icon, so you want to make sure that it uses the mp3 icon that's you know, used by Apple. Um, so it's another uh, just nice way to, to dis um, disguise it. So here's uh, just some pieces of the code. Um, it's really simple. Uh, you know, getting system information using AppleScript, um, there's an object that's actually available um, that you can actually quickly grab that information. Um, and then one thing I wanted to do is uh, you can actually open up a web browser and pass data through that way. Um, there's other um, ways you can transmit data. Um, but I just used iTunes. I was actually able to um, encode the data into a query string and then basically make a, a call out through iTunes. 
Um, and actually, if you download this, and um, it's on usbhacks.com, you can download it, um, and uh, it'll uh, it'll actually um, g gather information, send it off to a server, um, and then it'll actually start streaming an MP3 from the um, the web server as well. So while you're gathering information, people are listening to music as they expect when they click on a, a .mp3 file, right? Um, but you know, luckily with um, some of the new protections with uh, like Gatekeeper, things like that, it actually blocks this capability. Um, it'll actually um, you know, give you an alert that says this isn't a trusted application. Um, uh, if you put this on a flash drive, it's not going to give you the internet warning that, hey, you downloaded this, this from um, the internet. Um, if it's on a flash drive and you give it to someone and they run it um, and they have Gatekeeper disabled, this will function uh, perfectly fine. So. I've actually found a lot of people actually disable uh, Gatekeeper just because it's a nuisance to them. Um, and uh, it's something you may want to look at in your environments as well, because uh, some of your employees might be doing the same. Um, so, you know, this is a long time ago, but USB is still an attack vector. We see it, um, you know, pretty much regularly in the news. Uh, the Stuxnet, you know, it was initially uh, delivered via USB. Uh, you also saw um, USB malware that actually hit the International Space Station. Um, and, you know, you guys remember how that got there? They uh, had a game on a flash drive and they brought it in that happened to be infected. Um, so it wasn't anywhere on the network or anything like that. But again, it's just, you know, people with flash drives are very, very dangerous. Um, and then in 2012, there was a case where there were actually two U.S. power plants that were um, infiltrated when an employee uh, brought in a, a, an infected USB stick into the environment. Um, and then at Black Hat, there was another, a whole new uh, uh, USB um, exploit that was um, shown, and they actually scattered a bunch of flash drives in the hotel. Uh, people picked them up and they uh, plugged them into their computer, um, and information was gathered the next day. Uh, there were other flash drives on the, um, out there, and it was actually copies of all the information they were able to gather. So um, this is still, <laughs> still an issue. Um, so, you know, that's a, we talked about just, you know, IP address and um, uh, just one piece of information, but um, a lot of times it's not just, you know, one piece of information. You have to actually gather a lot of um, data and start connecting dots. Um, this is what I call, it's a, a crazy wall. You guys ever seen, like, uh, CSI when, you know, they're trying to track a murder and, you know, they have all the different evidence and they have them, uh, like, a red string attached to it? Um, well, it's very real. Um, that's actually something that a lot of um, uh, law enforcement actually utilize to sort of keep uh, track of evidence. Um, and that's kind of how I think, too. Th this stuff is a lot easier using tools now, like Multigo. Um, they have a case file or Multigo itself. Uh, those are really good tools for, um, for gathering evidence um, and making those connections. Um, so I, I highly recommend looking at those. But uh, this was back in the day before we even had that stuff. Um, so for example, uh, one of the flash drives we actually recovered, um, someone uh, you know, stole it. Uh, it was actually a professor at a university. Um, he had a lot of uh, sensitive information on there, um, also his thesis, right? So he wanted it back. He didn't have it backed up. Um, and so um, he activated tracking, and then we were getting connections from um, an AT&T subscriber. Um, that's not very useful. You know, again, if we go through law enforcement, um, that's going to take a, a lot of time to actually gather that information from them. Um, and a lot of times they don't even care. Um, but then we started getting additional pings from a, 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 a computer lab at uh, University of North Texas. Um, now this got a little more interesting. Uh, from here, we're actually able to work with, with uh, campus security and IT. Um, the nice thing is we had a, a timestamp of, of when that connection occurred. We had the internal network address. Um, we also found that um, to get into that computer lab required you to swipe your student ID card. But the problem is, is that the usernames on the computer were all guests. So, uh, you know, it was just a guest account. Uh, you didn't log in with your student ID or anything like that. So that was, uh, we knew basically who was in the room at the time, but um, we couldn't quite identify, you know, specifically who was, um, who had the flash drive. But we also found that the, that computer lab actually had gotten robbed about a year before, um, and so they um, actually installed some security cameras. So uh, security cameras also have logs. So which is nice is we're actually able to correlate logs from, um, you know, the, the system, from our agent. Uh, we're able to get it from the, um, the, uh, the uh, access card. We're also able to um, get footage of who was actually in the room from the camera. So that's a smoking gun. Uh, we were able to identify who that was uh, and uh, work with campus security uh, to uh, basically stand outside of his cl uh, class. Um, <laughs> and uh, when he came out, they were able to get it back from him. So uh, it was really nice. So, I mean, the devices themselves, we also looked at, you know, not just for flash drives, but I wanted to identify, you know, how can we also track more expensive devices that people will, will care about, uh, like a laptop. 
So um, laptops themselves are um, they're awesome when it comes to uh, surveillance um, because of all of the, the different sensors they actually have. Um, from the web camera uh, to the, uh, the microphone, there's a lot of capability here. Um, we can grab uh, screen captures, we can uh, key loggers, things like that. Um, just a lot of information. Um, we, I also looked at um, how we can actually get location uh, from uh, Wi-Fi networks. So at the time, this was around when the first iPhone came out. It didn't have GPS. It was using uh, uh, Wi-Fi location. Um, so I'm like, that's interesting. Wouldn't that be useful for uh, tracking stolen devices? Um, so I worked with the company that actually uh, had developed that technology to embed that into um, this software. Um, and this was really uh, useful because uh, law enforcement, if they just have an IP address, again, it's difficult to place that person behind the computer. Um, it, they also, it takes you know, anywhere from two weeks to several months to locate it. Um, but if you actually have a general location within 20 meters and you also have a photo of the person that, that took it, um, that allows law enforcement to work uh, very quickly to recover that device. Um, you can also monitor activity that's happening on the system. Um, you know, again, I didn't want to go too far down that hole. I didn't want to um, do any sort of screen grabs. I didn't want to have a backdoor into the system. Um, I actually found a lot of other uh, competitors at the time did have that capability. They had theft recovery teams where they actually have the ability to um, do a, um, use a backdoor to go into the system, install key loggers, install other tools. Um, and I thought that was uh, a little scary, especially when you're dealing with um, the enterprise. So uh, to give you an example how this works, if uh, a laptop gets stolen, uh, you activate tracking. Um, and then at the time, uh, it'll gather a, a, a photo of the person that took it, um, as well as network information and other data. Um, at this time, I was a little concerned. I didn't want to run my own server, so I was able to just integrate with Flickr. Um, that was nice because then uh, um, they don't have to worry about any photos, me watching th their web camera. Um, it goes directly to their Flickr account that they authenticated. So again, it's about balancing the, the, the privacy implications of this. So the location service I uh, used was uh, Skyhook Wireless. Um, you know, now geolocations, basically, it's, it's commoditized. Um, it's embedded in pretty much all the operating systems and all the devices that are out there. Oh, let me get some water a second. <clears throat> So it's, uh, it's native in OSX, Windows, Android, or iOS. Um, you can also use Google Maps, their API, if you want to write scripts like Python, things like that, uh, where you can actually uh, do this for free as well. So um, if you're experimenting with building some of these tools, I definitely recommend taking a look at the Google Maps API. Uh, sorry, it's kind of long here. I'll make sure that the slides are available so you guys can, uh, can play with this. Um, so the first actual laptop recovery I had was, um, it actually wasn't a laptop, it was an iMac. Um, it was actually stolen out of uh, someone's apartment in Brooklyn. Um, and so he activated tracking, um, and we started getting these interesting photos and location. Um, and law enforcement were really difficult to deal with. Um, they had dealt with you know, some of these tools before that only got IP address. Again, you know, he was really frustrated because it takes forever. He has to follow his paperwork. Um, and he, um, he didn't quite understand the idea of the Wi-Fi positioning within, you know, it's 20 meters. Um, and uh, then I said, look, just print out a photo of the guy, go to this location, and just start asking questions. And he's like, well, yeah, don't tell me how to do my job, all right? He's a New York cop. And, uh, and then finally he did. Um, he goes there, and they found that this was actually um, the owner of a tattoo parlor. Um, this is his office in the back. Um, and if you look at the photo, you'll see there's a lot of really cool stuff in the background. Uh, there's a nice big screen TV in this tiny office. There's mixers, uh, keyboards, all sorts of musical equipment. Uh, when law enforcement actually went in there, they actually found three laptops that were from different cases as well that were reported stolen. Um, so on this one, I like to say we had a 400% recovery rate. Um, but, um, and that was really interesting is that, you know, uh, this sort of provided a Trojan um, into some of these uh, fencing operations as well. Then we had another case that was actually, uh, it was the Portland schools, uh, where I'm from, in Portland, Oregon. Um, the schools kept getting hit repeatedly by laptop thieves. They would go in, they would steal all the, a bunch of computers, and I swear, a week later, when they get replaced, they would come back and do it again. Very brazen. Um, and, you know, they're really frustrated. So I work with the school district. I said, hey, I got an idea. Let's install my software on some bait laptops. Don't lock them up into the cupboard. I guarantee these guys are going to be back. And sure enough, they were. Uh, we started getting locations from uh, Vancouver, Washington, which is just, uh, just across the river from Portland. Um, and we started getting a, a bunch of photos. Um, and then uh, law, law enforcement got involved. Uh, they went over th to um, this location, 
And they went and they knocked on the door, and um, it just happened to be that the cop knew the guy who, who was at the door, um, and he's like, he, he didn't do it. This, you know, it's uh, uh, the guy that he does my roof. Um, and, you know, so he, he said, your technology doesn't work. Um, I got pissed off, so I went out there myself, um, and I actually started looking at the Wi-Fi networks to ensure that the information was correct. Um, and the, so this building, it's, again, it's within 20 meters. It just happened to be that it's a duplex. Um, and so on the other side, what was really interesting was there was a, um, a, 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 a car, and there was this big Russian pride sticker on the back of it. And one of the Wi-Fi networks that we were connecting through was Russia. That's what it was actually named. And then uh, a girl starts, comes out, starts washing the car, and then a guy comes out, and it's basically, it's, it's this guy right here. He comes out, um, and he's, he looks over at me, and I, I'm across the street from him, um, and I look like I'm just like looking for directions on my laptop really quick. Um, and then I called the police, and they, they actually came out, and they, they started working the case some more. Um, come to find out, this was an organized group. There were about uh, six or seven different guys that were involved. Um, they actually uh, were, um, had warrants out for their arrest. Um, they recovered the stolen laptop. What's really interesting with this, too, is that the police never told them that it was tracking technology that turned them in. Um, they got them to believe that they turned each other in. Um, and so they basically ratted on each other, and that's how we were able to get, like, six or seven of them. It was great. Um, so. uh, then we had a, another interesting case. Um, it's tracking Victor. Um, we had a, a, a laptop that was stolen, and uh, for like two weeks, I wasn't getting any connections. I was like, great. You know, they, they reformatted the hard drive or something like that, wiped the software. We're not going to get it back. Um, but then we started getting these connections, um, and it was in, in Missouri of all places. Um, and uh, we started getting tons of photos of this guy um, and all sorts of interesting things. At one point, there was even a hotel he was in with some girl in the background. Something was going on. Um, and there was, he was a very busy guy. He was all over the place. Um, and then a um, nice thing, too, is that he actually changed the username on his com the computer to his full name. So that was really helpful. And that was a really nice thing for him to do. Um, so then I was able to go out, and we actually found a lot more information about this guy. We found his MySpace profile. Um, found that he was really into Scion. Um, he's really into these cars. He loves his cars. Um, so I found that uh, all of his aliases on these various forums uh, where he's posting photos of his car, which was nice, because then we also had his license plate number. Um, yeah, it was great. Um, he was also a, a big power seller on eBay, where he was actually selling car parts. So you can kind of get an idea what kind of business he was in. Um, and then, uh, really nice guy, he ended up selling the laptop to his friend um, Omar, um, who also, uh, he also sold him a, a bike that was stolen. Um, so he, he got his, his buddies involved in the case as well. Um, so what happened here was um, uh, his father was the one that actually gave him the laptop. Uh, we found that there is these sort of uh, Russian organized crime groups. There's one in Portland, and they would uh, take stolen property, put it in a white van, and then they would drive it down to Missouri, and then they, they would exchange stolen property. Because where's the first place you're going to go uh, look when your laptop is stolen? Craigslist, right? Uh, so th this kind of helped them get around some of that, um, and they just exchanged some of this, uh, these, these stolen goods. Um, and, uh, yeah, we... Uh, ended up stopping that pretty quickly. Um, you know, other crimes we uh, ended up uh, solving too. Uh, there was a, a very violent carjacking in, in Brazil. Um, uh, two guys were actually in a car and um, uh, they, they were actually held up at gunpoint, uh, told to get out of the vehicle. Um, uh, the driver got out, they took the butt of the gun and, and knocked the guy out, um, and beat the crap out of him. Um, but uh, one of our, our customers uh, had his laptop in the back um, and started getting pings um, very shortly thereafter. And then we were able to, uh, to um, identify who uh, actually um, had the laptop um, and also arrested the two folks that uh, beat the crap out of the driver. So sometimes it's not just laptop theft that we, uh, crimes that we solve. Um, so after laptops, I wanted to um, move into mobile, um, which was a little bit more of a challenge. You know, looking at uh, like geolocation, that's easier because it's just a, uh, basically part of the operating system. Um, so you can make API calls. You don't have to do any sort of custom code development. Um, but the IP address is a much more problematic uh, on, on the carrier side. Um, the IP address changes frequently. It's really difficult to identify um, you know, a, a, a person. Um, and then photo and contact, you know, those privacy challenges with that. Um, so again, I was really concerned about um, having um, access to customers' information. Uh, I, I figured if I had access, a hacker could get into the system. Um, so again, we made sure that you could actually encrypt the information on the device before it actually gets sent to the cloud. Um, and this was all before the fappening that happened. Um, so that we can see that, you know, maybe I was seen into the future, I don't know. Um, but uh, for this next part, I'm going to show you guys a little video of, uh, of this uh, 
uh, one of these cases we had. Um, a bunch of Sprint stores actually started buying our software and installing it on their demo units because they were having a, a problem with them getting stolen. Um, and uh, I'm going to do this video and see how we track it. That's helping track them down. News Channel 8's Ed Teachout spent the past two days with police and investigators on the trail of swiped cell phones. He's live outside the Washington Square mm -hmm. Mall where the theft took place. Ed. Well, the managers of the Sprint store here at the Washington Square Mall behind me say they're very confident that tracking software developed only miles away from here and put onto their demo phones will lead to an arrest. Uh, this is a $500 phone. This ends up being a $450 phone. Two empty display cradles are all that remains after someone stole two demo cell phones from the Sprint store at Washington Square Mall on Saturday. Moments after surveillance video caught the theft on tape, employees initiated tracking software installed on the stolen phones. They were able to not only find the GPS location of the individuals that took them, uh, but also we've been able to, uh, to monitor any activity that happens in the phone. That activity turned out to be pictures someone took shortly after the phones were stolen. Tiger police admit it's a brave new world when pictures taken on cell phones can be told to send back pictures once they're stolen. And that has not only piqued the interest of our investigators, but in essence uh, appears um, at this point could be very credible information for us to follow up on. The Portland creator of the software tracking the theft says police are on the right track. If they're not the thieves, they definitely know who stole it. And if you look over the head of this man, you'll see in the window an Oregon temporary permit. Philip, this is Ed. With the help of a gadget track investigator on the phone, we tracked the stolen phone signal to this Vancouver apartment complex. There we found the exact temporary permit and... Hi. Sorry. The young woman who told us off camera, a man she called Peter, had sent this photo to her Saturday evening, but says she knew nothing about the phones. Hi, my name is Ed. We tracked the second cell phone signal to this duplex about eight blocks away. You don't have an, a Samsung Epic phone in this location? No. Then At least we're here yesterday looking for it. We're back live now outside the Washington Square Mall where we've just obtained within the hour the DMV records on that temporary permit. Tiger police say they hope the men in the pictures will contact them soon so they can explain how their faces ended up on a stolen cell phone. Back to you. Thank you, Ed. Teach out. The contract. And so uh, that was, uh, we had several uh, recoveries that were like that as well. Um, and, and this one too, when they uh, got these guys, were, um, I think there were, there were six of them. Um, and this is where we actually went in and also and recovered a stolen vehicle. Um, there were actually warrants out for one of these guys already. Um, um, and uh, yeah, just kind of an interesting case. So, you know, it's interesting to find that, you know, um, the amount of information you can get from images, you know, there's the images themselves when we look at surveillance cameras. Um, and with, when we're actually tracking uh, these devices, um, the, the GPS, the location was not coming through. Um, it was uh, way off for some reason. Um, however, the location that was actually embedded in the images um, that were sent, uh, there was GPS data, um, those were accurate. Um, and that was really great too because it also had a timestamp embedded in, in the photo as well. Um, so it was able to give us both a, a, a time and place. Um, and so I, I became really interested in, in EXIF data. Um, I actually uh, built a little tool called EXIF scan where you can actually upload photos and it'll um, tell you uh, if there's a serial number um, embedded into the image or if there's GPS coordinates. Um, and. Uh, so also, I mean, it's really interesting, too, is that we're able to get the, <laughs> the trip permit. Um, so that was just making it too easy. So if we look at EXIF data, too, um, you know, we were, uh, we're looking at how we encrypt data, um, images, and things like that. And so I became very interested in, in the metadata. Um, so th there's a lot of information that actually gets embedded in um, images, video, and audio. Um, the cell phone cameras will embed uh, GPS coordinates. A lot of times that's by default. Um, there's also a timestamp, which is really good for, uh, for forensics. Um, and I also found that you know, in, in high-end digital cameras, they will actually embed the make, model, and serial number of the camera that took the photo in, into that. Um, and so it was like, what if there was a way that we could actually search for that information? Um, th there was sort of a quasi way to do it through uh, Flickr, but um, it wasn't particularly um, user-friendly. Um, so um, I built out a tool um, that would actually uh, go out and um, mine some of that information. So I found that uh, here's a list of some of the core brands that will actually embed uh, the serial number. So this is more of the high-end digital cameras. 
Um, so the idea was that, um, oh, sorry, I got getting ahead of myself. Yeah, so the idea here is that if you had a search engine where you could actually um, search for a serial number, uh, wouldn't it be great if your camera was stolen? You know, there's a, uh, you find an image that's posted on Flickr three months later, um, then you can get your camera back. Um, so it was just more of a proof of concept. Um, so I actually had a reporter that contacted me uh, when uh, someone had some nude photos uh, leaked. Um, everyone was claiming that the, the phone was hacked, right? Um, however, the EXIF data actually showed that the um, um, it, multiple phones over the course of several years. So I was looking at it, but hey, it was research, okay? Um, so uh, what this revealed was that the point of compromise was actually email. It wasn't, uh, the phone wasn't hacked itself. Um, and the guy that did it was actually Chris Cheney. Um, he, he was able to guess the passwords, um, and now he's serving 10 years in jail. So uh, when I started uh, this idea of um, the EXIF data mining, um, I was actually helping another startup. They basically had a, a legal botnet, <laughs> sort of like a um, SETI at home type of thing where um, uh, organizations or people could actually uh, give up their computer's idle time to have it do uh, process jobs, right? Um, and so I had access to basically several hundred computers um, in, in uh, multiple places where I could actually deploy an agent that would go out and scan um, like all of Flickr, for example, um, and actually extract that information and then create a big database. Um, and it, it was nice because if you did this with just like a couple of computers, it would take years. There were billions of images. Um, we were able to get the entire, um, all of Flickr at that time, and it took about, uh, about three weeks or so. So I also found there was other uh, websites, uh, uh, 500 uh, Pics, Panoromeo. I was able to also get it, um, the data from TwitPic, as well as Twitter. Although Twitter at the time, when you upload an image, it would actually remove all the EXIF data. Um, the icon image, um, like for your profile photo, it would actually keep the EXIF data at that time. Um, so I was able to mine that. It was really interesting to have these tiny little images, but you're able to um, extract all this data from that. Um, so that was kind of an interesting case. So this is how it looks, was, you know, we, we would basically mine um, uh, all this image, we load it into a database, and then you could do a search for your uh, serial number, and then it'll show you the results of the images that we found online that were, uh, that were taken with that camera. Um, I put it out there just as something free. I was just kind of curious if this would work, and it did. Um, this guy, uh, John Heller, um, he had a camera stolen. He was actually on assignment for Getty Images. Um, about $7,000 worth of camera equipment was gone. He, he had just turned around, and his bag was, uh, was swiped. Um, it was at the Egyptian Theater. Um, he did a search. Um, he was able to see that uh, there were some images that were uploaded to Flickr. Um, he was able to map that to a, uh, a Facebook profile um, of another professional photographer. Um, and that professional photographer actually had uh, photos of his, uh, his gear. And we were able to see that, hey, there's his camera right there. Um, so the LAPD was involved in this case um, at that point. Um, and so what happened was the guy robbed the camera. Uh, he then sold it on Craigslist uh, pretty shortly thereafter. Um, the guy who bought it from him on Craigslist um, sold it on eBay. Um, and then the guy that actually had it, you know, we're basically, uh, you know, two people deep here. Um, and then um, they were able to get that camera back. That guy actually, um, the LAPD were kind of jerks to him. Um, he had to actually get a lawyer um, to explain what happened. Um, but uh, they were able to, um, to get it back. So they went to the eBay seller, they went to the Craigslist buyer, um, they went back to the apartment of where this guy bought it on Craigslist. This is a year later. They go in and there's all kinds of stolen property in the apartment, a uh, bunch of other cameras and things like that. So I think this is interesting because, you know, at the time that technology didn't really exist or really wasn't a way to, to find that piece of uh, evidence, um, but just unveiling this little tiny piece of information, we're able to actually solve crimes and, and retroactively go back and identify uh, where that camera was. So, you know, with that, there's a lot of uh, <laughs> other cases I had that were similar to that. Um, let's see here. We had uh, another case where um, a guy was selling a, a camera on Craigslist. I should just start calling it theft list um, <laughs> or crime list. Um, but um, he was selling, he was going to move, and he, um, he had this guy come out, and he was going to buy it, brought him out to his garage to show him the camera. The guy just pops him right in the face, knocks him down to the ground, and runs off with the camera. Um, and then using the tool, he was able to actually find uh, a bunch of images that were actually uploaded. Um, and we actually started gathering some other information about this guy. We started actually scanning, um, you know, a lot of other photo websites. Um, he was a professional DJ uh, and a professional photographer. Uh, what's interesting is that he would change these high-end cameras that he had almost every few months. So there was actually probably 20 different cameras um, that he was actually using. Um, so 
he's either, either very successful or uh, those cameras might be stolen. Um, and so um, he also uploaded a lot of photos that were rather incriminating. Um, he liked to take pictures of uh, his weed, um, uh, the unlicensed firearm, showing how, how hardcore he is. Um, he's also taken a picture of um, him and his girlfriend uh, smoking weed, driving down the highway. Um, and what's really nice, too, is that he was nice enough to take a photo of his speedometer, um, again, it was GPS, uh, we had GPS coordinates and a timestamp on this as well, um, where he's going over 100 miles an hour smoking weed on the freeway. So law enforcement really like this <laughs> information. Yeah. Um, this was also the, the, the uh, EXIF tool was all, I was reached out to by, um, the, by ICE. They wanted to actually use this for their child exploitation investigation unit. Um, this is a really cool group. They do some really interesting things where they actually try to identify, um, like if there's uh, these guys that are talking about doing things in forums and they post photos, um, they try to get the kids back before anything bad happens to them. Um, and they were actually, uh, they wanted to use this tool. The idea was that, you know, if, if uh, Joe Perv is, um, you know, using uh, one, this camera um, for, you know, taking photos of, you know, his family at Disneyland, things like that, um, they'd be able to identify um, who that specifically was. So, you know, it kind of uh, led me to, like, really research this stuff. And I, there's this guy named Edmund Lacard, and there's this, this thing called Lacard's Exchange Principle. Um, he's sort of the grandfather of forensic science in many respects. Um, at the time, he was dealing more with physical crimes, where um, the idea is that every contact leaves a trace. So basically, the criminal, he leaves something, and he takes something with him whenever a crime um, is committed. Um, this is sort of a precursor to like, things like DNA and things like that. Um, and I really believe that this carries over into the digital world as well, increasingly so. It's just a matter of um, you know, identifying technologies to gather that evidence or knowing where to look and having um, access to that data. So if we look at things um, you know, like a social security number, an IP address, we have all these little pieces of information that you know, by themselves they don't really identify a person sometimes. Um, but if we start looking at all these different pieces of data and then we actually correlate them, we're able to create a very rich profile of an individual. And then we look at things like you know, the Internet of Things, like all the data that's actually being generated as a result of that. Um, it's actually make, gonna make forensics uh, very interesting in the future. Um, you know, your, your smartwatch or you know, um, all your smart devices can actually basically become a snitch on you if you're um, committing crimes. Um, but that information can also be used against you. So I use a lot of this, these tools and this data to track criminals, but criminals can use this to track you. Um, and I look at things, uh, the interaction of things. Um, and I sort of classify the data in a few different, uh, different ways. First, there's data that's created by us, um, and uh, that's information that we're aware of. Things like uh, contacts, you know, we send our emails. These are things we're conscious of. We know we're generating this data, um, and we, have, we feel like we have some control over it. Um, then there's data that's created for us. So um, everything from news feeds, uh, a lot of other uh, data, um, it's um, basically information that's stored somewhere. We may not have control of that. We may not be able to delete that information. Um, and then there's data created about us. Um, so this is when we start getting into some of the over-invasive uh, marketing uh, efforts, right? We always hear about big data, um, all the information that's actually being collected and analyzed. And then there's what I call boogie data. Um, so this is data that, you know, at the time it may not seem like it's incriminating or can I can't identify anybody, but within the right context or, you know, further down the road it could. So I would even classify things like breach data, um, like Ashley Madison, right? Um, so um, those people believe that they, uh, their privacy was being protected. They had no idea this information could be hacked or it would be, be available out there. So um, it's information that, you know, at some point down the, uh, down the road, um, it can come back and it can haunt us. And I actually started working with a, uh, a, a company in Portland where uh, we built a, a, a mobile application that will actually identify mobile um, what mobile apps are doing on your phone. So we, we all know that you know, it, this app has certain permissions, but what information is it gathering? Uh, we found a lot of times uh, like a simple uh, screensaver app will be gathering location information. Uh, we also found that a bunch of information like uh, IMSI and IMEI, which are unique identifiers for your phone, were actually being gathered and sent to a server in China. Um, and so we, we did a report on that as well. But um, you can actually download this app, it's free. Um, it's really interesting to sort of see the secret lives of the apps that you're on, are on your phone. Uh, right now, it's only for Android, but. And, and that's it for my, uh, my presentation. So uh, um, I've got about, uh, about uh, 10 minutes or so, so if uh, anybody has any questions, I'd be more than happy to take some questions.
No questions? You guys are easy. <laughs> All right. Uh, not, um, so I'm working, uh, I'm working with uh, the spyware company, the Privacy Century. Uh, we're actually working on looking at some of the reports that are there um, where uh, we actually found these uh, libraries uh, for um, advertising networks and things like that. That's what's actually gathering all this IMEI data and sending it to servers in China and Singapore. Uh, that's kind of interesting. I'm not um, you know, working for the company. I'm just kind of an advisor for them, but that's been interesting. Um, and then I, I, my, my day job is, is, is a tripwire, so I, I spend more time looking at emerging threats, uh, presenting, and um, I just did a presentation at uh, uh, B-Sides DC um, on retail. So I, I really looked at you know, how those data breaches were actually happening, and I continue to, to do that kind of research. So. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it.